it's good to see you all. And uh, I'm going to turn my back on the audience a little bit. First of all, we're exploring Chatham, the layout of Chatham, the plat of Chatham. And so I borrowed, I was just talking with a fantastic prof over here from Sangamon State, UIS now, but the term a sense of place uh, came up in our history meeting, what shall we call this particular meeting, and uh, I think Megan kind of liked that idea, but uh, somehow it got incorporated, and that uh, term came from uh, several classes in the environments and people, environmental studies programs. Uh, it was environment, yes, environment and peoples, environments and peoples first. But anyway, sense of place, do we have a sense of place? What is our cultural identity locally, so forth and so on? So what I did was I developed a series of slides based on some things that preceded the town square, the village square, the village green, we all know where that is. And then I brought it up to date a little bit, compared it with other villages in Sangamon County and then toward the end, we will have some ideas, especially from panel and audience. Remember, this is interactive. That was the whole idea, and Jared kind of bought into that, where we kind of have open classroom, open discussion, uh, anybody that wants to say something. So it's based on memory. It's, it's, it's somewhat informal and subjective that way, yet some of the slides you'll find are kind of formal, so I don't want to lose you right away, so we should go to it. Um, title of the program is, you know, do we have a sense of place in Chatham? What is a sense of place? And uh, what about the past in the village of Chatham? Um, we look for a cultural identity, and uh, part of that's based on what we see and what we feel, what we look around and find. As a result, I put a couple of things up here. What is a sense of place? Our culture, our values, our behavior, our language, how we build in our community, in our localized environment. You might ask yourself, do I relate or connect with my community or residence or address? How do we see ourselves in this area of Chatham or Sangamon County or, or Illinois? Our identity begs the question, how we relate. It says that we should relate or have some relationship with our local bonding. That's our sense of place. And uh, many people have had different views about the village square over the years. It is returning and has returned over the many years to our, to a uh, prior sense of place, if you will, and it's uh, landscaped beautifully. Um, right now. All communities, villages, and landscapes have some sense of place, going down to the fourth bullet. We all have something, it's just a matter of how deep is the connection. It's a sense of place for inhabitants and even those who have moved to a new lo locale. We, where we go, we take our cultural baggage with us, so we might take village square ideas or Chatham ideas somewhere else, or we might bring New England ideas or foreign ideas or non-Illinois ideas to central Illinois. Before we get to squares and rectangles and 90 degree angles that abound in the Midwest, <clears throat> what I did was I went back in time a little bit to ribbon farms. And ribbon farms are, call, are, are long lots. The ribbon farms, sometimes they're 30, 40, 50 feet wide or, or much wider, and they might go for a quarter of a mile, half mile, three quarters of a mile, usually lined up on a waterway. And so I thought, well, how could we precede all of this township and square and um, 90 degree angle uh, approach? Well, we need to go to some places or a place in Illinois, Kaskaskia. So I got some uh, really good information on that, and uh, that's worth an afternoon or an entire morning in and of itself. Uh, also known as strip farms, long lot farms, or long lots, this European model was used by the French in Illinois. Uh, there were no squares per se, but there were gathering places. There were major streets or thoroughfares. There, there may have been a, a place or a plaza, 
some kind of a square that wasn't really a square, it was like three or more streets intersecting, so you have this general area where there might be a market. But prior to that common bond, that sense of place, we had a different uh, sense of place. I hope you can see this. Uh, this is Kaskaskia, and it is, or should be, a copy of an 1806 map. The map is from 1848, but they copied an 1806 map, and I found this in the Illinois State Archives, and, uh-huh. I'll, I'll go, you're over here, let me, let me come to you. Um, probably better with the lights off. But as you can see, here's the water, Mississippi River, Kaskaskia is back here, Kaskaskia River. Um, here are the common fields of Kaskaskia. Here are the ribbons, one right after the other, right after the other. You can see how they are the long lots, the French idea of surveying, and people would live along the river, or in the case of Kaskaskia, actually they, they lived in a village over here, people like Shadrach Bond, first governor, uh, Sidney Breeze, their homes and their, their lots were over here. So the ribbon farm preceded that. As you can see, there was a different way of looking at a village or setting up a village. The people lived along the river so they could get their goods out to the river. That was the whole point. And uh, the long lots allowed for a nice long cultivation and then maybe turning the oxen after an eighth of a mile or a quarter of a mile or longer. You don't have to turn your, your uh, animals uh, very often at all. So there was a convenience of sorts. And, and of course this certainly precedes and uh, is much different than the maps uh, that you'll see uh, here in a minute. But there was no village square. That doesn't mean they didn't have an identity. They just had a different sense of identity based on the old French system, seigneur, seigneurial system. And in fact, I, just, I was just in Montreal, believe it or not, uh, yesterday, and uh, was looking at the ribbon farms. I was amazed at how they were set up even today in 2015. So that, that culture lives on, but not here. We had to get organized here and have a different sense of place. So uh, it's very uh, fascinating how they are able to thrive like that. Another slide on ribbon farms, 1600s, 1700s. Um, they had to resurvey all of this. And here's a more of an aerial shot of the 1848 map that's a copy of 1806. So you do see some ideas about a sense of place, but it looks a little disorganized. To tell you the truth, this is the only model that we have. Here's a better look at the common fields of Kaskaskia, where everybody had a chance to graze their stock have their vegetable garden or what have you and still contribute to the local economy. Um, so I think you got the idea long and narrow, long lots. Here's an even better shot, the Kaskaskia Commons in the lower part. There's Chester, Illinois, if you can see that in the lower right hand corner and on and on, but you can see the they're beginning to square things off. You can see that some of the areas that were long lots are now being surveyed in a different manner based on the Land Act of 1785. So we're approaching the late 1700s. One of the reasons why we have the system we have today with the village square um, is uh, tradition. It goes back to medieval or middle ages or perhaps prior to that, but not in a widespread sense. The enclosure movement helped change all of this that was happening 
throughout Europe, especially in England. The enclosure movement consolidated smaller farms into larger farms. Yields increased. Common fields were eliminated. Remember those common fields in the prior map? The landless were forced to look for a livelihood in urban areas. This is a major movement. This sent thousands and thousands and thousands of people to um, what became the United States, to North America, uh, for their own land. But they were kicked off a really nice cushion, a really nice insurance uh, policy, a bit of security there, um, because they uh, didn't own the land, and the enclosure movement was beginning to square things off with walls and hedges and squares and rectangles. Uh, a couple of these maps are going to be a little bit faded, but the gist is, um, with the Treaty of Paris of 1783, this area uh, was really examined very carefully. The Big Ten Conference, whoops, right here, and of course the, the Northwest Territory was uh, ripe for plunder. Here's, here's Illinois, and uh, there were two major pieces of legislation that came out in the 1780s before we had our Constitution finalized. Uh, there were only thoughts about the Constitution at this time. And the two major pieces of legislation, one was the Land Act of 1785, Thomas Jefferson, the grid, the section of land, 640 acres, sections, half sections, quarter sections, uh, ideas about township uh, or generalities thereof, right? So with this area being um, subdivided and surveyed, we see that the United States becomes a little more organized. Here's another map which shows, uh, I think, Illinois as part of the Indiana Territory. And even more, Vincennes and Chillicothe. Uh, even more, uh, again, maps help explain a sense of place. Here we are, uh, Illinois is part of the Indiana Territory, definitely. Ohio became a state in 1803, and then Indiana and Illinois were one, as, as you can see. Illinois didn't become a territory until 1809. So the Kaskaskia map of 1806 that we saw earlier with all the ribbon farms, I mean, that predates, that predates everything. That's a really, really nice uh, set of maps that are available through the state archives. Um, here's a better view as we get a little more organized. Notice that it's becoming, uh, if I could use the term, a little more linear. Uh, uh, we we're not quite uh, um, using the uh, prime meridians and the baselines and the uh, angles yet, but you can, you can tell that it's beginning to take shape. Um, use of uh, lines, purple is Illinois territory. As we proceed, um, Indiana has developed its own territory. We, we have broken away from Indiana. So uh, that's good. Indiana became a state in 1816, right before us in 1818. So you can see things are shaping up nicely. But again, the lines are a little bit more, uh, I use the word linear. And then comes the Land Act of 1785. This was a real passion for Thomas Jefferson. Under the Articles of Confederation in the 1780s, that was known as the critical period in our nation's history. Um, the American Revolution uh, ended in, uh, let's see, the last fighting was uh, in the early 1780s. With the Battle of Yorktown, we finally settled with the treaty in 1783. What to do between 1783 and 1787 when we have the Constitutional Convention? What's going on? Organization. Jefferson was very much a uh, genius, the word is used so often, but he headed up a committee that was going to organize the Northwest Territory and anything else that hadn't been surveyed or claimed. And so he set everything up on a 90 degree angle. I'm keeping this very, very simple, but as I state, the Land Act of 1784, based on his committee work of 1784, Jefferson's grid became the established and recognized method 
by which the United States is subdivided, as, as we all should know. Land descriptions and measurements of the landscape were standardized and routinized. Uh, there was no escape after this. It wasn't where the creek is narrow down to where the old oak tree was and then back over here, okay, in that triangle, that's my land. It wasn't anything like that. It was absolutely standardized. Here's the proof. As we all know, sample sections, rectangular land descriptions, we subdivided and subdivided to the nth degree. And I include that from a plat book of Sangamon County, which shows that no matter what direction you go, you are going to face some kind of a 90 degree angle. It's going to become angular, may not reflect your state of mind, but that's how we're organizing. Could it be that the landscape is organized that way? It was. Could it be that towns and villages become organized that way in a standardized or a systematic way? It did happen. Okay. Here's another example. I included the township because I have a personal belief. I think townships are extremely important. I think they're the building blocks of the counties. Over 80 townships, over 80 counties out of 102 in Illinois have the township form of government. I think that's very important, especially for the rural people. Uh, roads and bridges are paramount. Here's a good example, a mile by a mile, section by section, 36 sections in a township to your left. And then of course, the difference between a township and a congressional township, all right? It is a political unit and part of our, part of our heritage, part of our culture. Uh, more measurements, I won't get into the math, but this is how down to the nth degree uh, we set up our life. Chatham Square is a good example. Chatham Square, 320 feet by 300 feet, exactly. And you can go to any map and it will show you that in its original form. Um, it wasn't just a common field where people could wander in and out. So as we became more organized, we see that the, I'm going to use the Northwest Territory, this area that we were clamoring for, surveying, claiming, settling, as we did in Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, a little bit of Minnesota. We see that the details of the township, the middle map, become absolutely crucial and of course section 16 uh, designated, pre-designated for school support. Schools always need support. It comes in different forms but they even thought of that and so it was a, a fantastic uh, opportunity again to organize. As you can see from this older map of Sangamon County, here is the fruit of the surveying labor so to speak. The building blocks of the county are the township, and I know you can find Chatham and Ball and Cotton Hill, and I'm assuming everyone here is familiar with the township. It may not be safe to assume that. And what the township does, uh, I was talking with Mr. Treat on the phone recently, the Chatham Township Supervisor. We had a great conversation. I think he's going to join our group. and. Uh, in fact, I complimented him on his letter. Do you recall his letter to the Clarion a few weeks back? It was fantastic. Well, well written, and he was talking about how important local government is and uh, how transparent it needs to be, but he was only speaking about the township. We won't go any further with that, except that he really believed in it. And he made a believer out of me, and I was already a believer. So he was very convincing. And I hope he does join us. What happens in Chatham happens in the rest of Sangamon County, true or false? Uh, well, in terms of surveying, it's true, right? But do they have village squares and do they have life around the village squares, which is why we're here this morning to kind of look at that. What life exists on the village square or did not exist? And I thought, I should look at all the other villages. Do I really want to do that? And it was an interesting inquiry. I'll have to say, 
I really enjoyed going to some of the older maps and finding out what was happening elsewhere. Of course, Chatham, I think, has the, the nicest plat. It's got a, it's a beautiful layout. Some of these are a bit um, individualized. They're, they're really idiosyncratic. You'll always see the railroad nearby or a major state road or county road that's going to intersect or, or bifurcate the, the urban plat. But here's Riverton. And uh, I got this from the combined atlases of 1874, 1894, 1914. I think we have a copy here in the Chatham Library. Chatham Library is just unbelievable with some of its sources, so we've got to give them a, a plug. But go no further. Investigate and use your library locally, which is what I did. I, I did a little extra digging on the ribbon farms, but uh, we have a lot here. So as you can see, Riverton is pretty angular, and as you can see in the very middle, and I won't point out every one of these because we would go on and on forever, but as you can see, it does have a centralized area, okay, with the railroad to the north. And of course, Riverton is so close to the Sangamon River, right? It's right on the Sangamon River, or was. Here's Buffalo. Uh, this was an odd thing, you know. Buffalo, is it really that big? Were there really that, that many people? And so I talked to a couple of these people in archives and I said, some of these plats, these must be ghost plats or fake plats or could it be? And uh, John at archives goes, no, exactly right. We call them paper towns. A lot of the villages were laid out, but not every lot was used. But this could be someone's vision. This could be the village fathers, the village authorities vision or somebody with high hopes in real estate. And so I thought, Buffalo, really? It's got that many? That looks like a major thing going on there. And as you can see, here's an interesting trend, life in the, in the middle of the village. Uh, I think this is the railroad here with, with the depot grounds. The depot, depot grounds right there. And uh, New Berlin had a huge depot ground. We'll get to that in a second. So is there a pattern yet? Is there a commonality? Do we all have some sense of place that might be linked somehow? So these questions started to come up. Here's Dawson. Dawson, the same thing, right there on the railroad. Um, Beautiful depot ground there in the lower left. Dawson, Illinois, Main Street, Walnut Street, Elm Street, all those wonderful village streets. When I looked at Kaskaskia, I looked up all the streets in the village of Kaskaskia. And they were in you know, Pecan Street, Franklin Street, Republican Street, all of these streets based on founding fathers or um, trees. Rochester could be a bit of a paper town. You'll see that uh, the railroad is in evidence. Um, no major gathering place or was there. So here's our neighbor to the east. But again, there is that pattern. Jefferson's grid, the Land Act of 1785 is definitely in play and then implemented by the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. So those were the two major accomplishments going back in the 1780s. Then we go from the 1780s to the mid and late 1800s. We fast forward and we see Jefferson's work, the Land Act, as implemented. Auburn, our neighbor to the south. Let's see, we have the railroad bifurcating, we have tremendous squared properties, we have, well, there's Union Park right in the middle, uh, just to the east of the railroad on Union Street. Do you, can you find Union Park? And uh, proof that uh, Auburn is individual, but no different than any other area. Auburn became a city. The rest are villages. It's 
Springfield's a city, Auburn, a couple of others. Mechanicsburg could be a bit of a paper town here um, with high hopes, but you can see Jefferson's grid in evidence. You see the center that didn't even say square, but if you find Main Street, see the blank space right in the middle there? Is that an area where people could gather? Would there be a business district near there? Right there, our business district, what was it? Mulberry? Maine? Around the square? Of course. It wasn't a business district, it wasn't the loop, it wasn't a business district per se, but that was where people thrived and there was, there was commerce and government. More on that in a second. New Berlin, um, maybe the biggest paper town of all, I don't know, but I think the public square, if you can find the public square as platted, it is up, ah, there we are, it's right there. Huge depot ground to the north and to the south of the east-west railroad here, public square here and life thrived there. What kind of life? Well, that's why we're here. Maybe we can come up with a few things today from our esteemed panel and your contributions. Berlin. Can't leave out Berlin. There's Berlin and New Berlin. Same thing, but a bit of an odd angle. I, I really like that. It's very interesting. Uh, you see true north and south to the left. But there is a square in Berlin. Have you been to Berlin? You probably are aware of that. Yet did you realize there were so many lots and so many homes in Berlin? And of course there aren't. But it's very deceiving. History can be very slippery. It can be very, you know, you really need to not take everything at face value. But they're wonderful maps. Heliopolis used to be known as Wilson. Same thing bifurcated by the railroad, and uh, not really a center per se. You notice that a couple don't really have a center or a village. Williamsville, same thing. Thank goodness for the railroad. There's Barclay. Pawnee. Doesn't Pawnee have the largest square in Sangamon County? I've never seen a, a square that big except for maybe downtown Springfield, but uh, it seems to me that it does. And uh, again, the pattern continues. So I kind of went on and on with this. I'm going to prove that we're no different than anybody else. Um, or are we? Ah, Chatham. There's the public square. There's where life is. Mulberry just to the north, bifurcated by the railroad, a typical, according to uh, uh, Illinois history of the Prairie State, Robert P. Howard, Chatham or a village like this would typify how towns were growing, how villages were growing. In Illinois and throughout the Midwest, especially after the Land Act of 1785, no common fields, no ribbon farming, everything a nice polygon, a nice geometric unit. Another one of Berlin. And so back to Sangamon County. So you see what I'm doing is I'm going from the general to the specific. Okay. So we looked at settlements in North America and in the Northwest Territory, the old Big Ten Conference. We looked at Illinois. Illinois kind of was part of the Northwest Territory, was part of Indiana Territory, became its own territory, became a state. Counties flourished based on population as Illinois was settled from south to north, etc. And then the townships became the building blocks of the counties, the counties, the building blocks of the prairie state. A list of those building blocks, you might see a couple here and there, 
that no longer exist or have taken a different name. But have you heard of Breckenridge? Sure, it's on the way to Taylorville, isn't it? Just on the other side of Rochester? Barclay? Bates? Bates was big. You know Bates just to the west here? So on and on. Jamestown? There must be a Jamestown in every state. Louder? Been to Louder? Sure. Get to know your county, right? But some of these are long gone. I see Salisbury that was absorbed by Gardner Township. And Fancy Creek Township? They took, they each took part of that. Salisbury could no longer fund itself. So we grow and then by attrition or deletion, we change. I just included a couple of things here. I'm not going to read these. I know you know Sangamon County history. Um, I like they, they misspelled, they misspelled John Campbell. This used to be Campbell Township, of course, and they misspelled his name. Uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. But Chatham Township, uh, they got away from John Campbell because they decided they wouldn't name the township after an individual. So they named it after the village. Um, fine. A little bit on Ball Township. Some familiar names there. Drennan, Dodds, Cox. If you look at the old plat maps, these names are preeminent. Sure. Cotton Hill. There actually was cotton growing in Cotton Hill. There were a lot of cotton experiments there and didn't didn't work. Obviously with the the great snow uh, that really set everything set everything right. Okay, so we are a very wide school district from part of Loami Township to Chatham to Ball to Cotton Hill all the way to the Christian County line and uh, I think we're the widest school district in Sangamon County. Sangamon County and the town square. Finally, finally. What is a town square? A town or village square panel? Wake up now. Here we go. <clears throat> Seriously, a town or village square is centrally located in the heart of a community, as is ours. It has a location in proximity to, and I, I tried to get some basic categories, but it has a proximity to government or authority. And I think you guys can speak to that, and I know the room can as well. If we're in the town square, what direction would you face where local government might exist, where there would be that authority? Would it be far from the town square? It would not be far. What direction would that be? Well, it depends. But I have an idea on this, and I think you do too. It has a location in proximity to business. I think it's a given, but I'll stand corrected, that business in Chatham tended to be on the north side of the square, or along Mulberry, and north-south on Main, and there were pieces of commerce, little bits of business here and there. Maybe not so much to the south, but maybe there were. We'll find out. But not far from the square. We weren't that large. I say we. I feel like I'm one of you. So, okay. Religion? Were there very many churches in Chatham? Yes. Were there any on the square? And Oh, I hope we... Yes, Thelma, I want, I want your feedback on that, definitely. I'm thinking the Methodist Church right away on the south side of the square. So we let's call this out. Let, let's bring this forward. And transportation. Now I'm referring to the IT at that point. The railroad's not too far to the east, but the interurban went right up Main Street. It didn't turn until it got beyond the square. The depot was on the corner of, oh, I, got, I have that in my notes. Does anybody remember the depot, where it was? Okay, let's talk about that. It is a meeting place, gathering place, marketplace, and represents common ground. So the Chatham homecoming is a great example, a modern example, a post-World War II example of common ground. A meeting place, it is a community event, so to speak. 
the Chatham uh, Sweet Corn Festival, which was it got too big for the square, but it was on the square for years as well. I don't know about business moving to the town square, but recently we saw Friendly Chevrolet. I've never seen so many cars on the town square, nor have you probably, right? That was quite a sight. Uh, I had to take a couple of photos of that. It's a, kind of surreal, but it is a meeting place. It is a foundation. There's our baseline right there. Here's Chatham in 1836. Thank you, Chatham Library. As you can see, uh, I just threw this in because I'm kind of finishing the maps with the best one of all. And uh, isn't this the one that Opal Lee rescued or had uh, blown up? And, and she's kind of responsible for bringing this 1836 map to our attention as a community, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, there's Mulberry and Chestnut to the north and south of the town square, long before the railroad. The railroad came in the 1850s. This is 1836, long before that. And uh, thank you for nodding your head in agreement, a couple of you. I want to, I want to get my dates straight. We're straight on that. Public space. Who lives on the town square? No one, but it is public. It is a place where you can find a sense of place there is a sense of place because many things occur in this urban, civic, public, and green space. Now the idea of the green space has changed over the years. Um, I remember a water tower on the square, right? And I thought, I don't know if I like the idea of a water tower on the square, but it's practical, it's functional, but that was removed. And finally, there was a strong community movement to landscape the square or kind of return it back to a more natural landscape. Uh, I saw someone the other day taking photos. There was a wedding at the Methodist Church and they went over to take photos in the square. You wouldn't have seen that 25 years ago or 20 years ago. Maybe you would have, but it was just the trees and the, the beauty of it all, it just wasn't there. It was a little bit more flat and uh, without character. Every community is represented, hang on just a second, Lee, I'm almost done, you guys can have it. Every community is represented by the town square, if one exists, and it identifies local values, customs, and traditions, while sometimes memorializing Americans with monuments and statues. If you go to all those squares that I presented through a really fast track through the maps, you'll see that some of the squares do have monuments, Chatham has a beautiful memorial to veterans. It's fantastic, and I've gone up there more than once just to walk around the memorial. Which names do I recognize from? Oral history, conversation. I had them in class. I taught here 36 years, so maybe it's a friend of a friend or a distant relative or some such thing. It is an amazing history that we have. And you want to, you want to look at a history that's not in a book, Look at the monument. So that's a beautiful sentiment, and it should be there. We find this particularly true uh, in the case of military veterans. Not so much political figures. Uh, my dad's hometown of Winchester, Illinois, in Scott County, on the town square, well, there's Stephen A. Douglas, but he was a teacher there. So they have a huge statue of Stephen A. Douglas. Fantastic. So we don't see that so much in Sangamon County. Again, Old Chatham, here's the coming of the railroad. You can see that the railroad is going to be surrounded on either side. So we're beyond 1836 here with the Thayer's addition to the east, which brings us to activity on the square and business. Leisure time is time that is free of obligation. We didn't have a lot of that perhaps in the 19th century. Freedom from chores, freedom from responsibility, freedom to do whatever, to have a conversation. Where would you do that? Where would you have that? Where would you meet someone? Recreational activity refers to non-work kinds of experience. Again, history has changed over time, so we see more leisure time and more recreational time. We see a change in attitude. We see a different way to work, a different time allotment for work. Attitude is the same as one's life perspective. So if you're looking at a sense of place, 
in terms of how to use the square, leisure time, recreational activity, and attitude, here it is, okay? The more time we have, the more time we can invest in other things. Maybe sleep a little longer, right? Maybe not be so quick to work, um, but just emphasizing the railroad there, I, I like this story. I have to, I have to digress a little bit. Self-interest, who benefits? The village of Chatham passed an ordinance for the Illinois Terminal, the inner urban. You guys know this story? Granting permission to build a right, to build right through Chatham, to give them that right, with the provision. So the, the Chatham fathers, the Chatham authoritarian figures, they were, they were thinking. And they said, yes, you can come right down Main Street as long as that substation furnishes lights on the square. So for the first time you have an illuminated square. This is right around the turn of the century, about 19, 1905, 1906, believe it or not. You provide electricity for Chatham and the square, and uh, we have a deal. And that's exactly what happened. And there it is. The terminal was located near the corner of State and Mulberry, which would be just east of the square. East and north a little bit. Right. And the stories about what happened at that, at that uh, depot are, are amazing, uh, and, and the train depot as well. It is said that once this happened, life in the square flourished. There were more than 30 train stops a day. If you look at the Chatham Depot and the Inner Urban Depot, more than 30 a day. That's a lot. So when I hear this story about, heard this story about, uh, again, let me use Opal's name. Opal Lee worked in Springfield. She could take the Inner Urban home. She could eat lunch. And she could take the urban, Inner Urban back and on her lunch hour. Well, that's cutting it pretty close. But I imagine, I imagine, well, in Opal's case, if it was going to be done, she would do it. But. <laughs> The uh, cutting it that close, it's possible. So there's the transportation to the east. Sangamon County, again, emphasizing Sangamon County, but our sense of place, our railroad sense of place. There's the Chicago and Alton, right? Chatham, Auburn, Verdon, etc. Now, in the village of Chatham, what was located on or near the village square? Now we come to it. What do you remember? Do you have questions? Your thoughts are? Which direction are you facing? If you're in the middle of the square and you're facing north, if you're facing east, if you're facing south, if you're facing west, if you're in the middle of the square, stay away from the monument, but if you're just right next to the monument, it seems this was a, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems this was a side of the square that represented power and authority for the public good. Mulberry Street is part of the business district, facing east, transportation, Main Street, inner urban, the railroads located to the east. Facing west, communication. Uh, Mr. Clark, we talked about uh, the telephone location, the local community operator on the west side of the square. I'm just remembering that. Do I remember it correctly? You might have some communication there. Residential, local government, religion facing south. I think I'm wrong on religion. I think the Methodist Church, but there were three churches. There were three, so we need to find two. But if you're on the square, imagine if you're on the square right now and you're facing a certain direction, what is there? And I've mentioned many things that could be there or that were there. And that, folks, it's your turn. Thelma, do you want to talk about the would you please tell us about the three churches? I, got, I was one for three, but I don't know the other two. Please let us hear you. Uh, well, the Methodist Church, the original Methodist Church, was where the church is now. It's just been added to. The Masonic Temple on the, on the corner. other corner was a Baptist. Oh. And then on the west side, across from what was the bank, was the Presbyterian Church. I mean the, you know, the yeah. Presbyterian right there on the square. 
And that would be a little bit, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's a little bit strong emphasis to have that many churches on a square, on a village square, or, or maybe not, but you might find one, but to find three on the square, that's a lot of religion centrally located, so that might reflect local ideas about religion or local values or... The Catholic Church was way down on Mulberry Street by the, cemetery, the old cemetery. That was where the Catholic Church was. Okay. But there were houses uh, on the south on the west also. Ed Hedrick, Leila Hedrick, and the church, and then Jim Long and his wife, Bill Jordan, who was mayor of Chatham for years. At, known as Tin Bill, right? Yeah, right. Tin Bill, and then the telephone office, and then uh, Mrs. Dunn, and then the Presbyterian Church, and Dr. Bradley then was where the bank is, and the Carey Garage. There were some houses where the community building is. I can't just remember who it was. Because the community building didn't go in until FDR's uh, work projects, and then there were, 1930s. There was a house where Lonnie Jones lived on the east side. And then the, later there was the Standard Station. And then early Chatham, the <coughs> Thayer edition, mm -hmm. that's where Mr. Thayer lived, is a car. A, the square like this, but he was up on that, that corner. Would it be there was houses on down uh, by the railroad? People lived you know, along the railroad. Would it be true to say that there weren't any homes on the east side of the square unless they were on the yeah. east side of Main Street? Yeah. Because well, of the. the house that I remember, it's yeah. a major. Okay. That's where the barbershop is now. Felmets. Old Felmets right there. Right? Is that it? Yeah. 